Hey guys, welcome to another installment of Two Guns No Ammunition, and I'm going to break it down here for a serious topic. Break it down. You know, I like it when my friends, you know, meet my other friends and they get along, but isn't it funny how they then become such good friends that they forget that they were friends with you and they go do friend stuff and you're not invited to their friend stuff? Mm. Isn't that weird? Jake. When, Very weird. Do you know anybody that would, that would happen to? Um... I can't, I can't yeah. really think of it. I don't know. Who are you? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> 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 so it, it happened it happened at, at work and like uh two guys two guys who don't really have like when they first started working there, they, they were they didn't really come out of their shells, right? So um uh, and I work in an environment of developers and they're not t- not all of them are super personable, but like I sort of facilitated this like little basketball league and we all got to know each other. Now we're good friends. Well, these two sons of bitches get new apartments that are only 20 minutes apart. <laughs> and they went out drinking one night. I was like, I've never even heard of them doing this. And I said, you motherfuckers, I made you. <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like, don't, weren't you busy and live an hour away? I was like, I don't care. <laughs> I, I, need, I deserve the opportunity to refuse. <laughs> I, I have a friend from high school. Well, okay, I'll start off with I have there. There you are two friend. friends from high school. Um, one of which, thirteen years later, is still angry with me for introducing one of our mutual best friends to his now wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the, the, once I like, they just. Ever since I introduced them, when we like when my friend and I were sixteen, he was two years older than us. He was eighteen at the time. He was a senior. Uh, ever since, like they've just like not really like we ha- we lost him as a friend in high school, and we he like still is on the fringes of our society. Yeah, but he's still angry with me for starting that thirteen years later. That's you got something going on inside of you when you're mad for that long. Oh, and speaking of exclusion, what concert are all of you going to tonight? Aurora. Yeah. The one with that Bill's not going to be at. Yeah, I must have yes. missed the memo, Christopher. Did we t- I bring it up? I thought I have explicitly invited you guys. Maybe I didn't. I don't know, I, but we talk every night, Chris. You and me do. before bedtime. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of friends doing friend stuff without me. <laughs> yeah. oh well, why don't you just play depth? But <laughs> I, I actually thought you were talking about me and Carl playing depth without you. <gasps> <gasps> you Drama. cheating bastard! <laughs> all right, Intrigue. all right. Everybody's sleeping with everyone. Before we get, well, we started. might as well all do it at the same time. <laughs> before we get started, oh, orgy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Before we get started on depth, we are going to talk about hopefully. <laughs> Uh, some technology-related news, and I just read an article news. that FedEx in several um, in several cities in the United States is going to try out delivery robots, short-range delivery robots between their locations and sometimes to like businesses and people around their distribution hubs, like drones or well, they're little six-wheeled, um, cool-looking robots. That hmm. like have a little a secure little thing that opens up. They put a package in. It drives to wherever it needs what? to go, and then it drives back. They're fucking adorable. Now, <laughs> I was reading more about this. <laughs> They're so goddamn cute. I can't stand it. There's a country <laughs> leading the charge on this. Oh I'll give you one guess. Just kidding. It's Estonia. Well, yeah, I, we're not Estonia. Estonia. What? Yeah, yeah. Of es- all places, Estonia is like absolutely. You can totally build your robots here and drive them all around. Now they made some regulations. They need like lights on the back and lights on the front and they can't weigh over a hundred kilos. And I was like, oh, that's so they can't be a bomb because I'm stupid. And then I was like, oh, it's because an incredibly heavy robot would destroy anything it rolls over. Um, And it it has to be like a certain height so that I guess people can see it. But they have their own like Elon Musk guy over there. Some super rich... Stony and Elon Musk. He's some super rich head of a robot factory company, and and he's just like, I guess the government's like, yeah, we want him to stay here because he's Estonian, and this is good for Estonia. So can I just point out that we can officially say we live in the future where you're comparing the guy that has the robot empire to the guy that has the spaceship empire? <laughs> yeah. True. 
<laughs> but uh, <laughs> I searched it up to try to get another, um, to bring up the link because it's on my other computer. But uh, the <laughs> one of the articles was like, pedestrian kicks robot <laughs> because it's going too slow. But yeah. What? So we, we've had this conversation time and time again about what we think the progress of AI and software and technology in general is going to be into not just the um, uh, high, uh, what's the word? High complexity computational space. Um, like I am of the firm belief that blue collar jobs, not just in car factories, but also like your plumbers and your carpenters and all of your truck drivers all the time. I hear this one a lot. They're like, well, you'll never be able to get totally rid of truck drivers. I totally disagree. They're all going to go. It's all going to go. And like I used to drive for a delivery company. I drove a truck around. I went to the back of the truck. I got the package. I ran it to the door. I came back. Um, during uh, the winter time, during like the busy season, sometimes you would get a runner. So you would just drive and then the runner would get the stuff out of the back and run up to the door. Now there's another company that does it. I believe they're unionized. So they do that like all the time. And when you break it down to that, to two people, it becomes a much less complex endeavor, right? Each one of those, because driving and going to the back and opening the door and picking the package you're supposed to get and running it up and all that sounds kind of complicated. But when you break it just into two, one just drives. Well, we've got robots that do that. Can you build a robot that can grab a package and deliver it? Well, Amazon's warehouses are hugely automated, <laughs> moving it all around. So the idea is, well, can we just take that robot and make it operate outside? Well, what are the problems? Can't get over hard terrain. Well, we'll build a better suspension system. Uh, what if it hits people? We'll just make it go slow. <laughs> and, that's what and that's what they're doing. So <laughs> there are these adorable. I just imagine like the slowest robot ever holding a package and like creeping up to your front it door. It should play uh, awkward tuba music as it goes. <laughs> 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 but and, and this is the thing that <laughs> like five minutes you're just watching from the front window. I think this is uh, hot chocolate. I think this is cool. I, I always get excited about this new technology, but it, I think it is a harbinger of the end of a ton of jobs because when you like for, for some reason in my mind, there was a difference between like, a driverless car and something that a person physically needs to get up and carry and do. All right. So here's a little picture of one of these robots. You see, I'm showing it oh. to Chris. You're passing that around. Would you, um, you know, that's cute. They are. That's and they've got cute. these six little wheels. What do you guys think Aww. of this? It's exactly what it's like at the size of a cooler almost. Yeah. I'm curious what your guys just general thoughts on this, these robots projects, this robot endeavor is, I think it is a, like I said, I think it's a harbinger of the end of a lot of manual jobs. Um, but I, you know, I might be facing some confirmation bias. I think it's exciting, but I also think I'm going to throw this out there. I think it's going to be a vector for a lot of new, um, kind of heinous acts. Like let, let's say fuck bots. No, well, no, let's say I had a beef with you, Chris. And I know that every Tuesday you order a pizza from Tony's Pizza. I just go to your pizza butt and I put a bomb on it. <laughs> and then oh it drives God. to your house. You go, hey, robot, kablooey. I think it's going to be tough. I think, I think there's some things we're going to have to figure out. But a Very interesting like concern considering you can already just mail people bombs if you really wanted to. I am convinced that the majority the of the reason, like the m biggest reason that a lot more heinous attacks don't occur is because people just haven't thought of it or mm -hmm. they have thought of it and it's like not fashionable enough, right? Like there's some like, and I'm not going to go into it because I don't know what the FBI thinks of this kind of pontification, but there's like a lot of horrible things that could happen. I remember one time. The History Channel is like, there's this neurotoxin that if you put 50 micrograms of it in a container of milk, like a milk truck, it'll kill 50,000 people. And I was like, oh, 
But nobody's nice. done that yet because that seems <laughs> easy. I'm sure, I'm sure there's not like armed gunmen watching milk trucks, you know? <laughs> Jesus Christ. But here, yeah. Maybe yeah, not yeah. your milk truck. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what you think about, uh, tell me what you guys think about these I robots. tell a howitzer behind mine. Yes. You're, you're open to the robots? Yes. I'm all about it. Mm. Yes, I am still a little bit skeptical or unsure, but... About what? Well, just... I don't know, like... I kind of imagine people ordering, like, a shit ton of stuff, as we do normally, and then just, like, tiny, slow-ass robots always driving around. Like, you just couldn't go outside without seeing one. Well, I mean, you could just make the robots bigger, like a truck size... And then have other little robots take things out of the truck. Oh my god, it's worse. Yeah, that reminds me of like the frogs that have babies on their backs. Oh, dude, those are freakish. Have you seen those? I, know, I thought about yeah. spiders with that too. Yeah, like that <laughs> spiders is... with all the babies on their back. Frank, Rubs what do you robots. what do you what do you think of the implications of this kind of work now openly being addressed by a robot capability? I mean, even it, it reminds me in some way of even self-checkout counters, right? Moving away from the necessity of having one cashier per lane. Now they have one per like four or eight or whatever, observing and troubleshooting. And Amazon is, um, they have their Amazon stores that just charge your card as you leave the store. They follow everything you pick up with cameras and then you just leave the store and then they just charge you. There's no cashiers. Yep. So what do you think, what do you think of the, what do you think this means for the market? Any market, ah, uh, auto. Well, the general goal and general result of of increasing like automation is increased productivity per remaining worker. Right. So, net for society so far that has been positive. There is the concern that people raise, and it's a valid concern in that it's theoretically possible that you're going to automate too much and no, not enough people will have jobs. I think, I, I hope that we've seen the evidence that that is not likely to happen because just like you said, like cashier, how long has self-checkout been a thing at grocery stores? Mm -hmm. 10 years probably? There's still cashiers at grocery stores. Some of them, like Costco, and well, if you count Costco as a grocery store, I know they sell other stuff too. Um, and Wegmans, uh, uh, they actually pay pretty well, right? So while it's true, there's definitely some places like Walmart that are the opposite, right? There's a range of potential outcomes here, and it's unlikely to be in the extreme in either direction. So generally, and it's it's like always careful, right? Automation is mostly a good thing. Historically, that's been proven. And th any of the negative effects that we see of it uh, can also theoretically, however unlikely this is, be dealt with through other like government intervention if done correctly. So this is there. Uh, can I cut in? Oh, yeah. uh, things such as um, the, the uh, w w worst case scenario, right? Over automation, um, the the equivalent extreme response governmentally, I think, will be will include at least. Um, uh essentially a social like like standard of living check right right so, 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 some some greater government involvement in simply meeting citizens needs because okay there's no work for them to do but there's still revenue being generated are we really going to let these people sit in squalor just because we're too efficient as a society that's bullshit and one way or another it would start to move in that direction it doesn't have to be a perfect snap though it can just be okay well we're we're going to adjust our um our income taxation system or whatever around a 30 hour work week and then 100 years later maybe around a 20 and 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 if it's done right, everyone's standard of living can actually rise. They'll still have some gainful employment, a shitload more free time, and you know reaping the benefits of of that efficiency properly. Um, and let's but, not, but the, the, yeah. the degree of class stratification could also still be what it currently is, or or go worse too if it's not done correctly. And let's let let's not also forget right that. In general, when we talk about increasing on automation, we're talking about increasing or decreasing the cost of production of goods and services, right? 
if you like somebody eventually does need to buy it so if you automate away all of the jobs there ain't gonna be anybody left to buy your incredibly efficiently produced stuff yeah (laughs) so like there's gonna be a balance here you know you know i it one of the things that i was really interested to learn about star trek after i watched the whole series like there's definitely money exchanged right like when the federation deals with the ferengi who are (laughs) <laughs> space Jews, it's fun. They're an offensive amalgamation of a space lot Jews. of stereotypes about Jews. Space Jews. It's like unbelievable. Yeah. Um, they just have big ears instead of big noses. Big no, they ears, also um, have big, horrible noses. They also uh, subjugate their women pretty severely. Yep. Uh, women can't own property. They're not allowed to wear clothes, etc. Yeah, they're always naked in okay. Ferengi society. I haven't, I haven't seen that part. And they make that an no. issue in Deep Space Nine. Yeah. There, especially toward the end, there's 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 several rights discussions and, and right. anyway. So you know the way that the buy it. the at least oh Earth, uh, the society within the Federation that's I, like the main <laughs> the main pillar of the Federation society, there is not a currency. People are not paid for what they do. Um, they are in a post scarcity economy because they have replicators. They can take any matter as a base and rearrange it into any other object or matter as well. Now, this is something that's been hypothesized now, right? So, like, let's say you, you, <clears throat> excuse me, dematerialize um, some base matter, you beam it across the universe in a beam of light, and then you have another instructional beam of light hit it and rearrange it. That's how they're like, oh, that's how teleportation could work of objects. You can move things at the speed of light. I, I don't fucking know, whatever. But when we're talking about incredibly high levels of automation uh i think we begin to have the conversation about in a practical sense post scarcity economies like you get to the point where everything is so efficiently made and so um so automated that the only real scarcities will be generated artificially you know by whoever controls whatever but in a practical sense, everybody could have something without the need for labor input from another human being, which I think the plausibility, I'm sorry, did you want to fish your, well, I, I, I think the plausibility of a post-scarcity society is um, a fantasy. I we also, we don't thing. have the framework to properly discuss a post-scarcity. It's all philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have like economics is about the, allo- the like uh, figuring out the most efficient way to allocate resources. And in a post-scarcity society, you no longer have to have that discussion. So right. economics, the entirety of what we have for economics so far, becomes irrelevant. And you have to go back to philosophy. And, and I'm no expert, but I mean, we're already kind of seeing the g- more than just glimpses of the new scarcities. Because as technology improves, I'm no expert, but like the materials that are required to make, the j- just the, all the cell phones we all have even, like that shit comes out of, you know... Central Africa um, for like pennies a day with people surrounded by armed guards and shit like like it's 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 we're already not um, and it, they're they're rare minerals too they're hard to come by uh, but we're gonna have to get up our recycling game something fierce um, or the new forms of scarcity are going to really put, you know, just ever increasing amounts of drag on our automation capabilities. Um, I don't disagree. Uh, we can always mine asteroids, though. We'll, we may get there. Eventually, and, you know, I'm not talking, I'm not even, I'm not talking on the time frame of our lifetime or our great-grandchildren's lifetime or anything like that. Assuming the Earth doesn't explode in the next thousand years, it's, I think the amount of progress that we're going to make is pretty incredible, but... What, what really what the crux of this is is the ability to take whatever material you need and create another element from it um rearrange it on a subatomic level right and and then and then nothing that's the holy grail yeah, yeah. yeah. and exactly. then nothing in the end is is scarce then because you just you just yeah. switch it out now i think i think to a degree that's possible you can add like it's you know, possible but it, you do it in like a nuclear facility and then it's radioactive. So that's not so great. But um, my point of this was that I think that we are entering into a phase where it's going to be 
the middle ground is going to be really, really hard because the, the thing that they were sort of saying this post scarcity is, you know, somebody wants for nothing. So everybody does. They're influenced by other motivators, right? Like maybe um, social respect, um, you know, their their inner morals, they're pursuing their passions. They're not motivated by money. So they do what people would do if they didn't have to worry about money, yeah. which I don't know how that's going to be. Well, there's still going to be people, you know, there are people, I'm sure, in Star Trek who uh, c c partly, you know, there's the prestige of, of, of exactly. climbing the ladder in Starfleet, yeah. but there's also the skill sets involved. Hey, how does the, okay, it's not all, how does the replicator, it's not all, hey, why isn't the replicator working? It's, hey, I'm going to fix the replicator. Right. I need to know how this this science wizardry works. Yeah. And and that in and of itself, with all everything else being in place, um, will, 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 make up for the lack of skilled labor because there are going to be people who are interested enough to, you know, whatever the social equivalent of monetize it will be. Exactly. But I, I don't think it would necessarily be money. I can tell you for sure. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If I, uh, no, I'm saying if, if money weren't an, an object, I would be pursuing different things, but, um, money is an object. So you got to make money. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I also agree with this idea that, it's a little too early to say that we're just going to run out of jobs because the the more that you free people up from this basic stuff, I think the more you allow specialization. Um, so like, you know, we, I, I always envision like general practitioners and then like specialized doctors. Right. And as we get more people, I, it's been in my mind that you get more specialists, but now maybe we free up a lot of this other stuff and people just focus. Right. So instead of being generally, um, applicable in whatever field, even a labor field, they become experts in something until the machines come and take those jobs. But there is this, there is this idea that I, I do worry in, I, I don't mean to sound elitist or anything. And I, and I don't, I think just some people don't, it's not their thing. This like high level intellectual, roles are just not their thing, right? Like, and you could say, Bill, you're the tech sector. You sound like an elitist douchebag. That's not, it, it's, I'm not including myself. And it's just, I think some people just don't want to do that. We also have to remember that when we get to this point, right, when we're talking about the extreme, that specialization is high level. Like you're talking about PhD level stuff, right? When you get to that level of automation and like the, the specialization that you would need requires that level of in-depth training. So we're not, yeah, you're not being elitist in the sense that everybody needs a PhD. None of us here are doctors, right, right of anything. Um, so you're, you're, you can't expect all of society to all of a sudden just flip a switch and all become, all be interested in attaining that level of education. I, th I do think that training. I do think that we will get to a point where there will be a dearth of jobs that are akin to like the factory jobs of the past, right? Like where you can, you can go through your minimal schooling and then enter the field. And then I worry that the bar will be set too high on academic ability and desire for everybody to have something to do. And then I think that's, what's, what's going to be frustrating. Now I could be totally wrong. Maybe the change will be so gradual that we'll see what happens in like in um, a lot of developed countries where the birth rate levels off. And then even like Japan, the, the population's decreasing. Maybe everyone will get there and the world just won't have a ton of people and we'll find this neat little balance yeah, somewhere. That's tough though, and it's like it's called carrying capacity. We're we're gonna have to hope that we hit that close to the point where we're at like post scarcity. Mm -hmm. Because right now, almost every economy relies on the fact uh relies on growth. Right. right? Um, so here's think about this. What, what would you say the contraction? So a, a depression or a recession in most cases, people define as a reduction in GDP, like a, a quarter or year of negative gross domestic product growth. Right. So what would you say the financial crisis? Like if you had to guess a percentage, the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, what would you say the contraction of GDP was? Genevieve, let's hear you. What do you think? 4.3. Something. I don't know what. Anybody else? 
You made me guess. Chris, you have to guess. We're guessing. Ten. Ten. What do I, th I, I think it, wait, the contraction. I don't yeah. know that it, I feel like it just, it's didn't grow. It didn't shrink. It just didn't grow. I'm telling you it did contract. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 1.3%. Okay. Three. All right. So you guys are all kind of, well, actually Genevieve was spot on. In was I really? Of, in terms of inflation, if you adjust it for inflation, yes. Uh, 4.3% 4. 4. was the, was the contract. Well done. Yeah. So I'm actually surprised. I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually surprised. All right, I'm ready to go yeah. home now. We're good. I'm actually surprised that you guys were in the single digits, really. Because Except the, Chris. Because the financial crisis was really bad. So a lot of times I hear people estimate like 50% right mm -hmm. the economy contracted by some half. people's 401ks fell that far right and that's, that's what they they think yeah yeah they think oh well the stock market went down by half so gdp probably fell by half and that's that's not how it works um no but that's that was really bad right i i don't i don't think most people appreciate how and i you can argue that some decisions that were made were not necessarily the most efficient or optimal decisions but the decisions that were made prevented were were at least good enough to prevent absolutely major distress right and when i'm talking major distress i mean i'm talking about worse than the 1930s worse than the great depression like, were we really looking at that if things would not have gone like very small things could have went differently and mm -hmm. we could have gotten to that point yes Whew. Like if all of the major banks would have failed, then yes, wow. we would have, we would have been to the point where honestly, like we would be probably pretty close to where Venezuela is at right now. Holy shit. Yeah. Mm. It, it had that potential to go that bad. So who did it right? Uh, the Fed um, and the, even to an extent, the stimulus package offered by the government. Um, but most importantly, the, the Fed uh, react while well, they could have done things a lot differently and maybe prevented it from being as bad as it even was if they had acted earlier mm -hmm. um it's tough to say right. exactly but w what they did prevented a, something that could have been a lot worse what did they do they did was it quantitative easing or some shit right but most importantly they they bailed out they bailed out the banks yeah. right so they made sure that the banks did not just fail uh and not that like the FDIC exists, right? So people would, ha most people would not have lost their money, but a lot of people would have lost a lot of money, yeah. right? Because FDIC only insures up to 250,000. If you do it correctly, you can get like one and a half million at each bank based on how you title your accounts. But that's not the point. Most people are not set up for that, right? right? So we're being realistic here. Um, and like it just, it would have been really bad, right? Uh, so... The point is, if we get a slowing population, like one way, this is not the traditional calculation of GDP, right? But one way of calculating GDP is productivity growth per worker uh, plus like net population or times net plus net population change, right? So if you have negative population change, you better increase your productivity per worker Mm -hmm. greatly like like m m exponentially better than we currently do right otherwise you're going to have consecutive time periods of negative gdp growth and if we can see what it's like for a 4.3 percent decline in one year that then rebounded to i think it was like two and a half percent the next year plus two and a half percent positive wait it only contracted for one year it actually only really can yeah basically what yeah mm -hmm. holy shit i didn't know that yeah mm -hmm. yeah it um that's what that's what I'm saying. Like one year or even like two consecutive quarters of negative growth have a profound impact on the economy because we are so based on growth. Yeah. Isn't that kind of what happened, though? Because I feel like if I remember correctly, a lot of people were being laid off or like the companies were downsizing. So people were taking on like an extra job to fill up for that person who was fired. So are you saying people were people were taking on roles of people who were let go, which forced they're, within that company, that individual's produ productivity, productivity to increase. Right, because they're doing two jobs now. Mm -hmm. Or what was um, two jobs? Yes and no. The, you know, the net 
while they may be doing on a micro level two people's job, the idea is that company is now producing a lot less. So two people's job is really the same amount of work as one person's job, right? So if you think about like the total production, like think of like an easy way to think about it is with cars, right? Because also the car companies went bankrupt, right? <laughs> um, if GM goes from making a million cars a year to making 500,000 cars a year, and they all, but they still only lay off, let's say, 20% of their work, their workforce, right? Which is a lot. That's a huge amount of people to lay off. If you have 100,000 employees, you just laid off 20,000. So you're now, you went from producing a million cars with 100,000 people to 500,000 cars with 800,000 or with 80,000 people. So your, your productivity mm -hmm. per worker dropped considerably. Okay. So... That is that basically underlines a big fear of mine with the future of automation. If we end up cutting a lot of people and they just don't have anything to do, that could be <clears throat> bad, bad news. But I mean, we we as a as is humanity have been historically pretty resilient. I mean, we bounced back after some pretty pretty horrible stuff. So yeah, man, we, I mean, we made the, it yeah. through the plague. Like, let's, an, an, an economic collapse will not kill the species. Yeah, like ever. So. Only something that would wipe the, the the face of the planet clean would do that. Yeah. Um, but not if we make it to Mars. Go ahead, musky boy. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Got all do it, do it, do it. Yeah. But this interestingly plays into another story that I wanted to touch on a little bit. So Amazon had these kiosks where they sold their goods. They had like popular goods in little malls and those like like pop ups in malls. They've closed all those in America. I think they had eighteen, but they're keeping their they have these four star stores have you ever heard of these no yeah amazon has stores where they stock their highest rated goods four stars or above in a physical location and you can go in and you can buy the, those things in a physical store hmm. but i think and they have the reviews there and you can look it up and you can like look at the item but and i think they do the whole no cashiers you just pick it up and you walk out and it charges your prime account um and then uh, they've also been talking about creating another grocery chain mm -hmm. alongside of Whole Foods, which they just fucking it. bought. They're, they're, they're not own... talking about it. They're doing it. Yeah, you can you can get their store brand like snacks and shit through Amazon.com right no, now. No, no, no. I'm talking about they are, what Bill's saying is they are making a new grocery store. Yeah, I know. Separate from Whole Foods. And I it's know. not that they're talking about it. They are a doing it. physical location. Yeah, I'm aware of this. And they already have product lines to stock it. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. These four-star stores... Um, What's stopping people from just going in and taking stuff? Like, do they have security or? Oh, of course they do. Yeah. Okay. They probably well, also I mean, have like, have do you have to... to verify that you're a Prime member to get in? No. Like, so is... you do have to scan your phone though. Okay, so you basically like you have to have the Amazon app and you open it up and it gives you a barcode and you go in and it, yeah. Okay. So here's another interesting thing to think about. Amazon Web Services supports so many of the websites that we interact with on a daily basis. They do the data management, they host websites, they like all the technology demands for space and processing and shit, AWS handles for tons of places. Amazon or one division of their company, as I was reading an article, is working on um, very refined facial recognition technology and they're demonstrating it to a police department in Florida. I can't remember exactly who it was, um, which department, but they have a poll with a camera with facial recognition technology that they are leasing to the police department for pennies. And the police are like, it used to be, it would cost, it would be competitive between hiring another police officer or whatever it was and paying for this kind of technology. But Amazon's offering it like dirt cheap. So, what they have is they have a camera on a pole monitoring this thing and they show the tracking ability. And basically it's like somebody gets out of a car, it, it'll show their entire walking path through an area and it'll recognize their faces. And Amazon, I think, has been expanding their ability to do this sort of quietly. And after I read this article, Amazon went ahead and bought Ring. Now, if you're not familiar, Ring is a video doorbell company. And... Uh, as far as I understand, they bought the company and they, they sort of bought them for the people because 
like they didn't buy the product and get rid of all the people, which oftentimes happens in tech. They bought it and they kept like almost everybody because these people know this fucking product. But if you look at it and you say this company is working on, it, it's already got the Alexa. It's doing all this data mining, um, data aggregation. That's how they target you with, with products and stuff. Um, they're working on facial recognition technology. Now they bought a camera, a, a company that has cameras on people's homes. It sounds to me like they're working to develop this facial recognition technology so that it's everywhere. They're working not just to develop facial recognition. They're working to, I think their goal, and Jeff Bezos would probably not admit this publicly, but I think Borg. internally, his Borg. yeah, he's working to like essentially try and get literal detail like pictures voice quips like every piece of information he can about every consumer in the world that he can right and, right? and so, that's yeah again that's that's appearance that's age gender uh interests income credit score all that stuff he wants to know that all and then he wants to be able to use big data and analytics to sell you the stuff that you want and so when you were like, do they have security? It made me think they, they know who you are. Like if you yeah. walk in there and they look at your face, Amazon knows who you are. They might not go after you. I'm, uh, I'm alleging this. Like, okay, this is in fact, don't go crazy, but I'm pretty sure they could figure out who you are. Um, I mean, when Most I, assuredly. when I went to school, um, there were kids, there was that event at Penn state where a bunch of kids flipped over a news van and they all got arrested through facial recognition software, through Facebook. The police just comb through Facebook, and they're like, these are all the people that we got from these cameras. You're fucked now. <laughs> um, so it's it's pretty sophisticated. But, you know, I was interested to learn that Facebook, even if you're not on Facebook, even if you don't have a profile, they'll create ghost profiles. Yep. So they start to aggregate data about you through your friends and contacts and stuff and other companies, they'll buy data about you and they create a profile for you. Even if you're not on their site, they got you dog. Here's the thing. It's like, it's creepy, but at its base, right? This is like, what we're starting to see is like, maybe not what Adam Smith envisioned in capital, but like when, or in capitalism. But when you think about, uh, you know, what I mentioned earlier with the idea of economics being, the like the goal of it to m most efficiently allocate resources right like we're starting to get to the point where while it might be through manipulation we're we're getting to the point where the information is available for companies to be able to pinpoint their resources and direct them to exactly what people want and get it to them exactly when they want it Th this is the thing that starts to worry me this goes hand in hand with worrying me about um automation and I because in my head for the longest time I said well the machines can't replace our uh, creativity humanity's creativity right there's a level of unpredictability uh, free will all that shit that mankind is going to have well I've seen analyses of pop songs right and they all like really popular songs all have certain elements and They've there have been songs using software that have been created that people have found to be pretty catchy. Now I don't know if they've actually, you know, taken off or anything, but there are people who consistently write really catchy popular songs. And we're getting to the point where, especially through AI, now I don't know if you guys are familiar um with the way that artificial intelligence develops, because I wasn't I certainly wasn't familiar with it until I watched a number of videos, but basically the long and short of it is you, you give a goal to a program and then you give it like a set of limitations and then you say go. And the, the people joke that AI are just if statements, if this, then do this, if this happens, then do this, if this happens, then do this, but they become so complex that the people who originally started them, cannot necessarily grasp all the intricacies of the behavior. I mean, you can pour through the code or whatever, but it becomes its own thing. And what happens is you can give a goal, like throw this ball through that hoop, right? And the robot, the software tries to figure out how to do that, but it doesn't actually have to try. It 
applies random alterations to its systems and then runs 10,000 simulations. And then it takes the top 1%. And then based off of that 1% of effectiveness or the most effective getting towards the goal creates 10,000, uh, uh, thousands more mutations, does 10,000 simulations each, and then takes the top 1%. So it's, it's like an incredibly accelerated version of trial and error. Trial and error. It's Evolution. an incredibly acceler accelerated version of um, survival of the fittest. And like, it's like if you look at uh, bacteria and viruses, and part of the thing is like, why can't we cure the common cold? Because it changes so goddamn fast. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're reproducing all the time, and they're mixing together. and they're. We now have machines doing that. It's, it's the fastest evolution that we've seen. And, and once we get good at it, I, I think they'll be able to it'll be able to simulate what it, like what do we think is going to be received well creatively boom put it out there because we're not humanity has has proved to be not quite as unpredictable as we originally thought like you can you can still guess pretty well if a song's going to be popular especially with how it's advertised and all that stuff so i don't know it's pretty wild and amazon's leading the charge in one way, I guess Google is too. I mean, Facebook, all these companies with all this damn data. But, um, you know, what now you Elizabeth Warren wants to break them up. Is there, I don't even know what to think about that because, um, well, I don't know shit about it. Does, is she saying that they're big enough that they violate antitrust laws? Yes. Now, the way that I read those laws, and since I am a lawyer, side note, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, the monopolies are illegal if they exist to the detriment of the general population. So it has to be deemed that they're not good. Here's the part where I tell you you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> I, I, you're wrong. I read that. I read the... Ugh! <laughs> Did you read it on uh, Facebook? On no. The no. I did read it on the internet. That's where everybody reads everything now. It's fake news. Um, <laughs> oh. yeah. No, there's, there's a test, an economic test. Um, and I'll be honest, I actually forget the name of the test. But it essentially, it is somewhat similar to that. Um, but there is an economic test and it's very simple. And it basically, it's like a set of formulas about like competition, uh, pricing power, supplier power. If, if you've ever been to business school, you'll hear about these things called Porter's Five Forces. It's essentially like trying to model the effect of uh, a merger on Porter's Five Forces for an industry. Um, and if you reach a certain level that the government or the Department of Justice has set, then you are in violation of the antitrust law. And until you get to that point, you have not. And the way that the cases hinge when you have an antitrust case brought upon this is you essentially get a bunch of economic experts, quote unquote, I use those air quotes somewhat sarcastically, to sit there and argue with government economists about whether or not that will happen. And there is an entire industry uh, of, of in the, well, there is an entire industry of mergers and acquisitions, a subset of which exists, econ in, in which a subset exists of economists that are experts in how exactly how the Department of Justice uh, comes up with this rule and formulates it. And then they will pretty much do the, the analysis before they go to trial and tell the attorneys whether or not this is going to win or not. Well, we could be in for a wild ride. Yeah. Uh, all right. Final story before we hit the break. I was reading about this. I read it as like the Warriors draft first female player. And I said, the NBA is drafting a female player. I was like, that's pretty interesting. It is the Warriors NBA 2K819 Vidya game team just drafted their first female player. Um, I think she might be like the only one in that league. Um, but it was interesting. She was super psyched about it. Um, what did she say? She gets paid between like thirty-two and thirty-five thousand in California, which isn't really a lot. Um, but they cover housing and other expenses, which is what's really expensive. So, 
Um, if anybody wants to sign me to go pro for Black Wake, I mean, keep me in mind, <laughs> or depth, which we're going to talk about on the flip side. But I mean, I think this I think this means that everything's fixed, right? Everything's fixed. There's no... No, because we all know that if she's playing video games, she's not actually a female. <laughs> there Females, are no gamer yeah, girls. No. They don't exist. Yeah, exactly. None. And of course, some <laughs> guy who's put a lot of effort into looking like a she, girl. She said in the article, uh, she's like, yeah, some people have said like sexist and hateful things to me. And they're like, a lot of people tell me to get back in the kitchen. And then, I, like, I had to pause. Mm -hmm. I had to pause. One of the guys at work was telling me that his daughter does uh, uh, cheerleading. And apparently their cheerleading competition, like a regional championship, had protesters. Had what? Protesters, protesters? Oh, okay. yes. And protesters these... or protesters? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... A month, they're like, you shouldn't do this with children. You're turning them into whores or something. One of the other things that they said was women belong in the kitchen. What? What? Like, I just. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> like, well. <sighs> huh. I don't. Who, who still. Who clings to that? Who? Here's the thing. The way I see it is this. Yeah, women belong in the kitchen, and so do men, uh, when they're hungry and are making food. We were sitting there. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy. I, I agree to that extent. I, we were talking <laughs> about this. I, take, I, take, I, I don't take offense to that, but I argue <laughs> uh, the number of times I've seen you hungry and not in the kitchen. <laughs> yet I order a lot door. of food. I'm extremely lazy. <laughs> but... That is a personal decision <laughs> as a as a strong independent woman yeah. that Maybe. I make. Yes. I was mentioning this on uh, Blackway because we'll talk about it when we get to depth. But somebody was cyber bullying me, and mm. I was I said something kind of mean to him, but I thought about saying something really mean to him, <laughs> and like uh, I didn't because it's different now. I was like when I came up. And I'm not I'm not saying I was there for the beginning of the internet, but when I started playing like Counter Strike like 15 years ago, like the things that people said were absolutely heinous, and everybody loved it. <laughs> it was before like the mainstream knew about this whole community, and you said some fucked up wild shit. Your usernames were fucked, and everyone was like, "This is so much fun. It's the fucking Wild West." And then, you know, normies got into it and got all fucked up. But progress <laughs> is progress, whatever. So, uh. I remember back in the day, somebody made that joke. They're like, get in the kitchen. And it was like, ironically about, like, you were making fun of edgelords. Because even then, it was a super dumb joke. It's been 15 years. How is that not, like, I can't. How can anybody Bill, I think you underestimate exactly how far behind the times some people are. Oh, yeah. Well, I suppose. And I'm willing to bet they're like, 13. Oh, whenever I see this kind of shit, except for the protesters, because I guess they were adults. It's all 13 year old. The, yeah, they're, they're like, I'm going to. I've decided it was a to be. class project <laughs> to go protest this I've event. decided to be an edgelord. Oh my God. That is true. Uh, you always, you have oh to remember, there are all, there is an, always a new generation of people who have never seen this shit before and have to discover it for themselves. And then, you know, you know, it, you got to live through it again. It, like, and this is one of those things, like, I know this isn't how society works. But I wish that real life sometimes was more like the WWE. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> There's somebody says some shit like that, and you just go over and you like throw them off of a, a cage in Jokes Hell like in a it. Cell. You know, something like that. <laughs> and then the problem's solved. And nobody gets really hurt, but they learn their lesson. Through the announcer table. You know? All right. I do have one more thing if we're willing to discuss this now, or we could do it later. Uh, Is it related? Yes. Do not it. to chair throwing or WWE. I'm not or, interested. No, just go. Um, <laughs> Tonight. It's mostly related to Am it's related to Amazon, go. what we were previously talking about. Uh, Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, this is a local interest story, recently banned cashless stores, including <laughs> the Amazon pop-up stores. Oh or not pop-up stores, I'm sorry, but the Amazon cashierless stores, essentially. Now, they did make an exception for any store that you have to have a membership to get in like, oh so amazon uh so that's the weird thing the amazon cashierless stores do not require prime so uh, yeah 
No, uh, I, maybe they might make the maybe they might make the thing. Well, you have to be a member of Amazon. Now, I, I then that's the thing. I don't remember if the language of the bill that the city council passed included it has to be a paid membership or what. Um, but yeah, because yeah, that would make the difference, right? You just have yeah. to sign yeah. into Amazon and right. Why would they make it illegal in the first place? Like, check what's jobs. That? No. No, uh, they they were saying things about discrimination against uh, lower income people, yeah. the elderly. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and when New York City said you couldn't get any new ride sharing drivers for the next year, it was to study traffic. I mean, come on, why why does New Jersey still have people pump your gas? Well, really but, job well now, I, really though, this is I, so. Um, I I have. An acquaintance, I will not call them a friend because they're in one of my classes, who works for the city government of Philadelphia. And it really is like it's it is the council people of the poor neighborhoods in, you know, North, you know, North Philly, West Philly, uh, that they're the ones against it because there are people they're like, it's not fair. I've got people in my in my district or my ward or whatever they call it, where they get paid in cash. And they don't have a bank account. And you're now saying that they have to, like, if they want to go into the store, they have to go pay $5 to get a visa, a reloadable visa gift card, when before they never had to, right? And I kind of get it, but yeah. it's kind of just like, I don't know. I, I do, I mean, I'm surprised the government doesn't just lean on this thing that like you always have to accept cash. It's legal tender for all debts. Well, see, that's the thing, though. It's only, it's only legal tender for debts. So if you have no so if debt. you leave the store and then you owe the store, right for taking it, then they have to. Then right. you're stealing. I just owe you debt. Well, even I mean, even just like using a credit card, like you, you have acquired debt, you can pay. Uh, you you can effectively pay your credit card with cash if you want to. You have to go get a fucking money order. But or or if you like, if your bank is local, like uh, you can walk in and pay that way. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Well, I think Am uh, I think India was already like, we're getting rid of cash by like twenty twenty seven. Yeah, because there's so much corruption, we're not fucking doing this no more. Yeah, that that is the thing about cash is that it's anonymous. Yeah, um, and when cash is changing hands where it shouldn't, yeah. it's just about impossible to track except by some other means. It's an yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting. I love. Things like this that come up, and they mostly come up at the local level because I guess you could try and spin it that there are left and right ways to look at it, but for the most part, it is a nonpartisan issue, right? There, there is no established, uh, in the United States at least for this, there is no established Democratic and Republican uh, stance on an issue like this. So, I mean, it, it kind of creates an interesting discussion where you don't know who's going to come out positive for what and against another. Right. Uh, because if you don't have anything like if your party doesn't already have something telling you what to say, then you have to decide yourself. And look, like most politicians are not very good at that. So uh, it's it's always interesting. I'm kind of a little angry that they they went that way. I just I don't see and I, I understand the you know, I understand where they're coming from when they say like it, it discriminates against uh, people with lower incomes which al always tend to be minorities and it's it's like that is true but there's no like there's there's no intent to discriminate right right so legally that's why this was possible you, there's no intent to discriminate and i don't see all businesses do it like this, those people are still going to have somewhere to shop there's you know? there's only going to be a subsection of businesses that give up cash. Yeah, and I and I, I see the argument against the implementation of those systems because whether or not the intent is um, discriminatory based on uh, protected yeah. attributes, the effects can still be. And yes. then we got to go. All right, that's not cool because and then you don't want to end up in like, well, they've got this place to shop. It's separate but equal, and that didn't work out. That's that true. Time. Yeah, yeah, that is true. But I just I. I don't see, and, and maybe I was wrong, like it could have been an issue where, the, I, I mean, clearly they didn't address it, and I guess, I don't know what tipped the scale where they decided they needed to address this, but it it has been legal, and there are, like, I think Sweet Green or Honey Grow, I don't remember what the name of the restaurant is, but it's like a an upscale casual dining place uh, that is already cash, or that was already cashless, and there were a few others, I think, smaller places. I just, I didn't see it being so widespread that it needed to be addressed so they could have i feel like they could have waited longer to address it i think this is 
much like that um, that iPhone case. The was it like the San Bernardino shooter or something like that? They he was a he killed a bunch of people or he's a terrorist or something, and they had his iPhone. And they told Apple, you have to let us into your encrypted phone. Mm -hmm. The government was like, you better fucking do it. And Apple's like, we're not going to do that. And they got pushed back. And then the FBI was like, actually, we figured out how to get into it. No problem. After it looked like they weren't going to legally win. So I think I sort of feel like they're just waiting around for uh, the opportunity to make it a larger issue. And the thing that I think they're waiting around for is um, a decision on whether or not uh, the like three letter agencies can push for a largely cashless, like really largely cashless uh, interaction because the amount of trend spotting that you could do, even ignoring all the possible um, maladies of it, the amount of trend spotting that you could do through spending behavior analysis to find people who are going to do heinous attacks. It, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. If you get really refined, uh, analytics, you know, or algorithms and codes and, uh, uh GUI. Yeah, there we go. Now I sound smart. Um, <laughs> GUI. But I think it is in the interest in a lot of the powers to be, to minimize untraceable, uh, transactions. So I sort of feel like yep. we're going to, we're going to hit a point where it has to go one way or the other. Since I'm an expert, take that to the bank. Break time. Yeah. Break now time. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. You guys were supposed to. Welcome back. We're going to hit depth. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you a really heart wrenching story about how I was cyber bullied. Trigger warning. Now I make, I feel like I can joke about this because back in the day I was actually cyber bullied. Oh no. Somebody pretended to be me in high school and asked out a girl who did not like me. And then everybody was like, oh, how can you show your face in here? And I said, what are you talking about? It wasn't cool. Rude. Yeah. I, uh, I found out who it was. Did you wreck their shit? No. I, you know, I was in a huge pussy and no. just let it go. Like Gandhi. Call me new Gandhi. All right. Uh, oh, so boy. I was playing uh, the old Depth. Now, if you guys don't remember, Depth was on sale a few weeks ago on the Steam sales. Steam sale. For $5. Boy, howdy, has it been a good $5 That was spent. an excellent $5. You picked it up, and I said, fuck, I forgot to, like, I forgot to buy it. And I went on. It was still $5 on sale. Indeed. So I bought it for me, and then I bought it for um, Sean, friend of the podcast. And I also bought it for Carl, friend of the podcast. And then I bought it for a guy I don't no even know. His gamer tag is Norman the Normie, because it's $5. Who gives a shit? <laughs> and the... Uh, the the four pack, the bonus for like a that was way more expensive. They forgot to discount it. They had already discounted it, but I missed it. So I bought four copies for the price of four. So twenty dollars instead of fifteen dollars. I think it's still probably fucking on sale. Anyway, this game has turned out to be a shitload of fun. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I have applied a lot of my more recent lessons to this game. Um, one, I'm willing to do research, although I'm having a hard time. I'm like shooting guns all around and I'm like, how far do they actually shoot? Can I just unload my magazine and will it walk or will it shoot accurately? Does it have counter-strike based aiming mechanics or its own? They mentioned that some of these guns are the um, gyro jets. Now, it was interesting. I was telling Chris about this over the Discord, which is super fun to play with your friends. What a cool 
invention. But do you remember the forgotten weapons we saw? Gyro, uh, the, the gyro jet? Yeah, the gyro yeah. jet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They actually, the, there are mods of that gun for Fallout New Vegas. So the Good gyro time. jet is uh, a gun that ended up not being commercially popular, but it shoots little rockets instead of mm-hmm. projectiles propelled with gunpowder. So they actually accelerate after they leave the gun, which is the complete opposite. Which of, is why they're super inaccurate and ineffective. But. Right. Well, this game uses them underwater. And I'm pretty convinced that they went, I like this gun. I'm going to create an entire game just so I can have an excuse <laughs> for it to be good. <laughs> well, uh, so we were playing. And as you know, you can be either two sharks or four divers. And when I first started playing Black Wake, I had the opportunity to get in and become a good captain. But I was like, I'm not very good at this. I'll deal with it later. Well, I fell so out of pace with everybody else. There's no chance for me to catch up. I started playing with Carl and playing with him on the video game too. And uh, (laughs) he's like known throughout the community. He's getting recruited by like competitive teams to be captain for them. I could have done that, but I I didn't have the gumption. And I said, God damn it. This isn't going to happen on depth. There's only like 20 people playing in the entire northern hemisphere, I'm going to get good at sharks. So I was playing through one game, and this guy goes, I'm a shark. Another guy's a shark. He goes, dude, what the fuck? He's like, what are you talking about? Or I just said, what? He goes, get out. I was like, out of what? He goes, the game, lol, you're new. I said, so what? And he said, I don't have the time or the patience because you couldn't spell patience to carry you or teach you. And I paused for a moment and I've seen this. We've had this kind of shithead veteran in the games uh, in Black Wake and it can really kill a community, right? Because somebody new comes in and then they just they just don't get started. And I said, how do I address this? How do I, how do I reach these kids? So what I wanted to say to him was, why don't you go suck start a shotgun? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty harsh. I could just, I could just say kill yourself. Well, it's pretty standard internet burn, you know. I'm like, ah, this kid's probably 13. Maybe shouldn't encourage suicide uh, for anybody of any age. So I said, well then, I invite you to blow me send and after that he uh he didn't say anything and then i started to do really well and then he was like bossing me around and i didn't acknowledge him but he did say ram steve i'll take care of the rest and that's what i did and we won and he ended with good game i have never seen the like in real life the confront a bully thing actually work Mm -hmm. probably because when i was a kid i was getting bullied i like didn't have the gumption and when you're an adult it like it's way different um but i guess i had a 13 year old interaction i was was like no uh blow me and he's like i respect this guy now and we got along i so i feel i think i'm a hero i think i'm a hero you're a good man charlie brown yeah at least you're not an hero i told you um I told you my mom's two favorite uh, catchphrases, right? Um, Fuck them if they can't take a joke. And blow me, clown. (laughs) Yeah, if she's had enough of any conversation with anyone, (laughs) she will say blow me, clown, and leave. And there are no consequences because everybody thinks it's hilarious. So I've started to utilize that in the game sphere, and it turns out really well. <laughs> but other than that, it's been a lot of fun. Oh, Chris, yeah. you and I have been playing. I've been playing more than you. I'm catching up to you now, though, yeah. for sure. It's it's definitely good. And um, so, like I said, I, I started to do a lot more research, and I'm uh, there. I I can't quite find a good wiki. I got to find a really good one to find out like the actual mechanical behavior of the game now. If we recall, I used to have an issue with this because I felt like you're you're removing some of the magic of the game itself and replacing it with like equations. Like if I do this, then I know this will happen. It takes some of the excitement out of it. But this game, I'm in when it started. I want to get good. And we have come up with a little formula. Mm. So when we first start, we've been getting this little like oozy. Oozy, ooze. Nice, nicely balanced. And then if you get enough gold... You can give it poison, and what that does is even if a shark muck ducks you, they have to go heal themselves by eating a seal, or they get poisoned to death. And um, 
one of the taxes we realize is that the Sharks have to run up their score in the beginning of the game or else they almost can't catch up towards the end. Mm-hmm. Because by the end of it, the players will have, especially if you haven't killed them a lot in the beginning, they'll have a lot of gold and they'll have really good weapons. Um, but on this Discord, I don't know how the chat works. I've only heard people try to chat with us in-game once. But when you and I are talking on Discord, we do so well. Oh, yeah, we kill it. And was like, it, it, it's so, I mean, just like as always, it just makes it so much easier to coordinate our attacks. We've, we've done this thing, and you and I came up with it. We're like, all right, we're going to shout the position of the sharks uh, relative to the way that Steve, the money robot, the gold robot, is facing. And it worked well for you and me. And then I told that to Carl, and he's like, that's a great idea. Yeah. So we started doing it. So we're coming up with a pretty neat little system. And now we're building out systems on how to progress through guns. So one that I came up with was the cheapest gun and then get poison on it after your first death because I'll have enough gold by then. Keep that all the way through to the second best gun, uh, second best automatic weapon. Buy that. It's basically an AK. Throw poison on it. That it'll be like mid game. There'll be probably 10 lives left by then. 14 to 10 lives left for the sharks. Use that until you get 23 gold. Then make them super hot rounds like they shoot harder but slower and then just body all the sharks bop, 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 bop. but a big thing has been coordination between like us buying sonar i noticed like even if you can't see the shark if one of the sonars turns red you know it's around yeah. this game keeps getting better and better Yeah, the more i play it the better it's getting so i'm like little things like that with the sonars yeah. like that was huge i was like oh and i i don't know what it is but it has been like I'm finally, I finally feel like I'm in a fun squad based game because, and, and because Chris, you, you made me get on discord. I was like, I don't need that. I don't know why, because I'm a fucking douchebag. I was just like, no, I don't need it. I resisted it for a while. I don't need so did I and yeah. What? It's kind of great. Yeah. It's well, I don't use it other than like it's when I perfect. need to use it. Well, here's the, like, I'm not one of those people that just like, it's not to me like AIM was when I was in like fourth grade where you just go chat with random people, strangers on the internet. Like I'm, no. I, some people do use it for that though. I like, use it for that uh, with a very small handful of strangers, yeah. And yeah, I, I, that's that's not what I use it for, but man, is it a great tool and it's so well designed and laid out. It's it, great. It's, what, not, it's not perfect, but it, it gets a lot done. And something I'm going to cover on, on another episode will be uh, their, they have a gaming platform. You can subscribe to Discord and play games through Discord. Well, also, it's free. I, I, what I have really enjoyed about it is, first off, it feels less personal than a phone call. I'm not picking up a phone, dialing somebody's number, and uh, talking to them on the phone. Which, it, maybe it's because I'm an old fuddy-duddy, but there's some sort of social, like, it feels like a th- whole thing. But if you call somebody on Discord, it rings through, and if it if they don't pick up, it doesn't just hang up. It stops ringing on their end, but they can join the call whenever they like, right? And it shows you what they're, like, if they're playing a game, so you shoot a message, and then they're like, all right, let's, you're like, all right, let's do it. You join in, you jump on the Discord, and it, it's literally like talking to the person right next to you. The quality's pretty good most of the mm-hmm. time. There's not a huge delay. It's awesome. It, it, and it, it has almost captured that entire feel of uh, side by side. It's like it's like AIM and uh, services like Ventrilo mm-hmm. wrapped up in the one. Yeah. And the really nice thing about it is it has push to talk, but you don't need it. So we can just it, it's like we're sitting in the same mm-hmm. room. Now, if you were doing that through the game, it's kind of a pain in the ass because not everybody wants to hear what you're saying all the time. So you have to do push a button to talk. And that's, it's just less natural and it's, it's tying up one of your fingers for something else. But, um, I think we're on the bleeding edge of tactics in depth. I haven't unlocked everything. Although this, I did use my first crafting ability. I I haven't done that yet. Yeah, it's pretty neat. You just use like six of any, basically they're skins for your guns. Six of whatever level you put it in a crafting pot. And you push craft and it gives you one of the next level up. So mm. like common to uncommon, then six uncommon to rare, and then six rare to one super rare or something. Whatever. But um there's definitely some high level competition on on uh, on there right now. Like yeah. we have played some guys and we rec- we're starting to recognize the good shots. Uh, yeah, we're we're definitely recognizing a lot of people. We're running into a lot of the same uh, people that are playing, and we know who's good and who's not at this point for sure. Yeah, I was really impressed with how engaging this game is for everyone, and I think it's because 
it's not really it's not heavy into one genre and it sort of stands alone it 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 sort of feels like counter strike but it's not as quick or as overwhelming yeah. and it's in 3D and you're underwater and it's fun and it's like they do a nice job with things they do nicely on but it doesn't take itself too seriously like you have played it i have played it um Carl, who doesn't he doesn't really play FPSs. He's all about Blackwake. He's on there now too. Like he sees me and he jumps in. He's never done that with any other I, game. Yeah, we were, I, I hopped on. And next thing you know, him and I were both on our Discord, like our trio Discord. Yeah. And next thing you know, we're playing, which is pretty neat too, right. because you guys met each other virtually one time, aside from being on the podcast together, which was years ago. And then you're playing together, and it's like God, it makes it so easy to casually be friends. And, and just get in there, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it'd be much more personal. To call, hey, Carl, I know I only talk to you. One no, what time. can what can you do on a phone? You can talk. Yeah. What you're doing on Discord is playing a game together yeah. and talking about it. You're you're active. Mm. It's yeah. not just hey, let's converse about something. You're you're achieving a. It's, it's collaborative, right? Um, I mean, you could call and on the phone while you play. You on could do phone, that. But, yeah. Um, anyhow. Uh, what what's been your favorite thing so far? Oh my god, everything! I I just love it's it's just so fun. I just love it. it oh, it, this it, the suspense of being underwater in the darkness, dude. They so you and I have, have when when the sharks get closer, there's a heartbeat and it, it speeds up the closer they get. And we we both feel like there should be one more like level. one more notch of that. So it's like boom 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 boom, and it should be like boom 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 when they're really on top of you. But then I thought about this. In a game where I was talking to you, I think when we were streaming, these sharks literally came out of the darkness. And as a player, I was sort of pissed because I couldn't shoot them. But this game organically creates some incredibly scary situations. Mm -hmm. Like the, the suspense is up and then out of the darkness, you just see a shark. You go, oh, no, go, chomp, chomp. And your friend's got to save you. It is but it happens so many times, so many it games, so thrilling. So many times, so quickly. Yeah. Because like you could be, you're gone in an instant. Mm -hmm. you, and, and Or he can come in here, you barreling through, and next thing he hears, go, 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 ever going around you. It, it's it's so fast. Yeah. There's um there's one shark, the Great White, you can upgrade it so you take 50% damage. So I did that, and I swam into a room, and I set off a, a sea mine, and it explodes, and it shakes your whole screen as the shark, but I was still alive, so I charged into these divers, and they didn't fucking know what to do, <laughs> and I'm thrashing around. I, I, I don't get more hype in that game than when I'm a shark. Like, you've heard me over Oh, dude, going, you're, you're bad. I'm going to bite you. I'm going to get like, <laughs> nothing real cool, but it's so fun. And uh, playing with Carl... Um, I thought he was, uh, I thought he was like smoking a cigarette or something because I hear him like over there. But it turns out he, he was doing that with me too. He is so like, because that, and that's the, that's the feeling. Yeah. Because you're, you, you're sucking all your air in because it was just like, whoa, because yeah. you don't expect anything. Mm -hmm. You're like, you're expecting something to happen, but what, what happens is never what you expected. And the game has really positively nailed the amount of time investment to keep it engaging like each round is maybe 15 minutes mm -hmm. and there's not like a huge wait time if you're like all right i'm going to try this path it's not like a game of civ where you play seven hours and then you end up accidentally doing your previous plan this one is like 15 minutes you get through and then you can just try a different one if you want mm -hmm. so you can it's not like when i was playing this war of mine where you're like oh my god i'm 40 minutes in like i'm 40 minutes in this game this plan is not going to work i'm two hours in this game is not going to work you know it's 15 minutes and you get no mm. shot so what i really like too uh about it is like versus like other like online multiplayer uh fps games is that you you have like a physical like objective like you you have to gather gold right. like you still so you're not just out there just trying to kill shit because like remember I was just like oh my god I got all these kills why didn't I get why am I so low in the rank and yeah. you're like bro you didn't get any fucking gold <laughs> <laughs> so like I was like oh so I'm like so and then I was like oh so that just it, you're constantly doing something there's constant. this constant there's this neat little uh, dynamic when you pick up gold it gives everybody extra gold. And I don't think you spend from a community chest, but like when everybody, everybody gets gold when you, when you get it. So you can get this little, um, little like underwater jet thing that pulls you around super fast, faster than a shark can swim. However, if you pause for one second, they will then chomp you mm -hmm. if they're chasing you. 
but you can upgrade it to get um it's like it costs like twenty one hundred dollars total each piece of gold that you collect gives you 50 bucks and whenever steve opens one of the four chests you get sixteen hundred dollars but um you can get an electromagnet and a treasure finder. So it highlights all the treasure all over the whole map, and then you just zip zoop over it, and it automatically picks it up if you're not going too fast. Nicely balanced. You can't just zip right over it. Well, what happens when I do that is I die a lot, but my teammates get really rich. So they end up <laughs> having really good guns early, but I'm just like, I just get killed. So it's still really balanced. It, it, this game is, again... I don't know if they tried harder, they stumbled their way into it, but it is neatly balanced all around. Okay, yeah, it's very, yeah, it's, everything is very, very even. Uh, even though, like, humans versus sharks, like, I mm. feel like the gameplay for that is pretty well balanced. I yeah. didn't think so at first, but, like, the more I was, like, getting good, mm -hmm. um, it's very comfortable. I think everything is, I think it's very fair. Yeah. Uh, in terms of things, um, except for the one, remember oh, going into the shark attack? Is that what you were going to talk about? Like with like the frame issue we were bitching about with the shark attacks. And what was that? Remember, so we were just dying within like a frame, and we were convinced like a frame was disappearing because we were alive. Next thing you know, the it, we it, we were seeing the animation for our, our dead body. In, yeah, in the there's water. there's um, I think there might be some sort of power that makes these sharks if they like run you in a wall, they kill you. But I I do think that there is some hitbox lag so that like even though on my screen my character has moved to the right according to the server it hasn't um and it usually it'll defer to the shark and be like oh no actually you got chomped you know um but it, that's sort of the nature of multiplayer games and we'll see how that goes but uh i have tried something new i oh. switched off of poison especially in the beginning um and i've switched to stamina depleting bullets Right, so huh. in the beginning of the game, um, when the players don't have very powerful weapons, the sharks like to come in, tear up, turn, and attack another person, right? Because everybody has like shitty pistols, yeah. and they might actually survive. Well, if you shoot them with the stamina depleting bullets, they can't lunge again, which means they can't bite you. Oh, that's really useful. Yeah, so they like, I didn't know that they like mash and lunge, and they can't get over to you. See Ooh. tactics, tactics. We're pushing the boundaries. Ooh. So if anybody wants to start a pro depth team, give me a call, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I'm fucking ready. We're ready. We're ready. Now we're just we just got to peer pressure Jake into it. And if Jake starts playing this goddamn game with us, that is proof positive that this game knows no bounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why? I have to agree. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't understand that. Man. You don't. You don't really do online multiplayer. So if we can that's get true. you to play it and you okay. love it, then yeah, that's true. I, I have uh, been long divorced from the online thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm just going to keep, as long as it's $5, I'm going to keep buying it for everybody I can think of because we, we're at the point where we just, I, I did purchase it that week. So we just I need more people. It. Awesome. Um, somebody's calling me. All right. Um, Frank Frankenfield. Yes. Civilization six. I heard you're God tier now. Not quite God tier. I am not a deity yet, but I am immortal. So. For those who have not played Civ 6 or Civ, the Civilization series in general, there are eight difficulty levels, starting uh, at the first difficulty level, I think, I believe is called Settler, all the way up to eighth, which is Deity. I currently, historically, I've mostly played at the Emperor difficulty, which is level six. Uh, and I recently bumped up in Civ 6. So at the end of my career for Civ 5, I was playing on Immortal. But for Civ Six, uh, I have mostly kept to Emperor um, because I haven't played it as much. I don't have as much time to dedicate to it. But I just bumped up to Immortal for the first time and won on my second game. Damn. Oh I yeah, am boy! A fucking boss. Boom. So a lot of people complain about the Civ difficulty because the AI doesn't change at all for Civ. It just gets like a fuck ton of bonuses. So at the easiest difficulty, you get like you start out with like multiple settlers and some builders and some military units, and the PCs, the AI units only start out with one settler and like a warrior. When you get to king, you are both balanced. You both ha there is n no one has any bonuses to their uh, th their start at all. And then on emperor, immortal, and deity the bonuses increase in reflection to what you receive when you start. So they'll get, um, but actually I think they're a little more pronounced because you, uh, on immortal, I think they start with two settlers, two builders, 
and uh, three warriors and a scout, or maybe it's three scouts and a warrior, and they get four free techs, four free civics, and then a boost to gold per turn, science per turn, culture per turn, faith per turn, production. Like, they get a boost to everything. And all of their units have a bonus to combat strength. So there is pretty much no part of the game that the AI does not have a massive bonus to when you're playing on Immortal. So all you're doing is just starting behind the eight ball and trying to catch up. It's the only difference between the the difficulty levels. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I've talked so far before about the the difference with the what the expansion has brought, Gathering Storm, and I gotta say, like it just it keeps getting better. They they they're really doing well with this. Um, wait, did I did I get a chance to talk in the last episode about the about it? Uh, Lisa so. covered it on a a few episodes ago. The the Gathering Storm DLC. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, it like makes it adds weather and climate and uh, adds diplomatic shit. Yeah. So I got a diplomatic. My first immortal victory was a diplomatic victory, which is the new type. A l- I think a lot of people are actually saying that it's not necessarily one of the harder ones, but like it's it's not the easiest by far because you're directly competing against the AI who tend to get a lot of bonuses. So it's easy sometimes for them at the higher difficulty levels to rack up diplomatic favor, which is what you need to buy votes to become basically elected. It's not really elected world leader, but it's, it's essentially elected world leader. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was pretty happy with that. I've got another game currently going, uh, where I believe I'm going to go for a culture victory with Greece. I've played three of the new civs that came out with the with Gathering Storm, and they're all super OP, <laughs> as tends to be the case with the uh, Civilization series. The, the ones that get released tend, not always, but tend to be more powerful as the game goes on. So the starting civs are the weakest, and then uh, over time they just make more and more powerful civs. Mm. Which is a little an interesting dynamic, because that also works against you. Um, if you if you play as one of them, right, it makes it easier for you unless you play against only the new ones, in which case they're all really powerful too. So that sucks. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's it's great. So the the climate thing, what I've noticed is, and and maybe this is just the way my games turned out, but I've only noticed the climate situation becomes an issue when I myself am polluting a lot and if I don't pollute a lot it doesn't seem like the computer pollutes a lot the AI it's the, I, I don't know if it's like instructed to follow your lead on that or not or if it's just a lack of available resources because the way it works is if you have power plants or units that consume coal or oil you will generate emission carbon emissions and then based on the number of total global emissions the temperature will increase and then sea levels will rise and you'll get increasing natural disasters. But the natural disaster mechanic is really cool. Uh, at the beginning, it, it honestly, it's a little balanced. They kind of need to change it probably. And I believe they will. The way it mainly works is there's a couple different main types of disasters. You can have blizzards, droughts, uh, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, and volcano eruptions most of them end up providing a net benefit. So floods and I shouldn't say most of them, floods and volcanoes will increase the fertility of the tiles that they affect. So you'll get more food out of them after a river floods or a volcano erupts, which makes sense. Volcanic soil is very fertile. Um, The problem is climate change as implemented in the game currently doesn't have that many negative effects other than sea levels will rise. And that will potentially destroy some of your tiles. But it tells you what tiles are going to be affected. So, like, right when you settle a city in 5000 BC, you can, like, click on your settler and it's like, this tile will no longer be usable when sea levels rise one meter. In, like, 
4,000 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> After you had, you had climate yeah, scientists in right. 5,000 BC? Exactly. Now, I mean, like, from a game mechanic perspective, it really wouldn't be too fair if you just settled a city somewhat near a coast and, like, it looked to you like, oh, this is a cliff, like, it'll be fine here, and then it just turns out to be under the ocean after a couple hundred turns, and you're like, oh, well, I shouldn't have settled my city here. Anyway, uh, I don't know how they're going to address that. One thing that I, I've seen floated on the internet a lot, and what I would like to see is as the temperature increases, some tiles become, like, turn from grasslands or plains to desert, yeah. and snow turns to tundra, and tundra turns to plains or grassland or something like that. Um, that would be nice. Uh, or droughts to become more common uh, is a big one because droughts are actually pretty bad in the game where like you'll have a first of all you'll have like a farm and it will just become it will go to the pillaged status so it will not be workable anymore um, or it will not provide its benefit anymore but also i think in a drought that tile now provides no food at all so i've had cities where you know there's been an extended drought and i was borderline about to have a city go into starvation mode because I could not get anywhere close to the food that I needed to support that city. Mm. And uh, so I, I, that's my idea. If you want to make the, uh, the climate risk kind of pack more of a punch in the game, because right now it's, it's cool and it adds a new element, but it's not a major determining factor late game, at least in any of the games that I've played. They, they kind of need to increase the effects of it a little bit. Very, very Al Gore like right now. Mm -hmm. Super serial. Yeah, it's just a lot of people talking about how serial the climate threat is, and you're like, uh, I lost like three tiles to sea level change. Like, Out of my like several hundred across my massive empire. Yeah, it's like, eh. Mm -hmm. eh. So build little... more jets. Yeah, <laughs> build more boats. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but that, that's an interesting thing is what I thought would happen is that only your cities would create pollution, but actually the units, like if you create an ironclad, which is a like industrial area, era um, warship, it's powered by coal, that ironclad will make emissions, will create emissions. Mm -hmm. So uh, any unit that consumes coal or oil does. So if you have a larger army you're going to contribute a lot to emissions. So it's a choice that you have to make. And again, I think that would make it pretty interesting uh, because a lot of people seem, and it's, it's pretty true, I don't go for domination victories very often, but a lot of people consider that to be the easiest victory condition to meet uh, just because the AI tends to be so stupid in maneuvering its units that if you have enough to beat one set of AI units, you can just pick your battles and then lay back until your units are healed again and go continue to pick them off. Uh, and eventually, because you will rarely, if ever, lose units, you will get your units promoted all the way where they are basically unstoppable Terminators. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, that, that would... If you created the situation where climate change really, really impacted the game and made it very hard to manage your empire... Um, because of its effects, and all of the, almost all of the late game units require uh, coal or oil. I should say a lot of the industrial or era or later ones. So like infantry and mechanized infantry, which is like the backbone of your late game military, requires oil. So do tanks. Uh, those are the two things you're going to use the most of. So do fighters. And battleships i believe as well and if you use them a lot of them and again they're probably the backbone of your army so you're probably gonna use a lot of them you're gonna pollute a fuck ton so if you if you were doing that like that would kind of balance out the domination gameplay uh because it would just make cli if climate change really affected you and you had to have a large standing army uh it would become much more difficult so i don't know it's i hope they come out with another expansion because this game is the best that I can remember in, in what I've played for Civ so far. I know a lot of people are still on the Civ subreddit or still in love with Civ 5. Whatever. It was great. I played like 2,500 hours of it. Uh, Civ 4, there are st still people who think Civ 4. But most of the people 
who, when Civ Five was out, thought that Civ Four was the best, have now moved on to Civ Five. Like they're just hipsters who have to be a game behind everything, um, and eventually they'll play it several thousand hours and get to the point where they're like, okay, I'll try Six now, and then by the time Civ Seven comes out, they'll be on Civ Six. But I hope that they support this one longer than they supported Five. Granted, it, it was five years between the games, so it's it's not like they just turned around real quick and did it uh, and created six after five. I think they will support this one for longer, though. I think this might be a seven or eight year game, mm. which is great to have a game supported for that long because it has, I mean, if you look, like it's something, I, I think I saw a GIF on Reddit, you guys might have seen this as well, of like the top 10 or top 15 games on Steam over the past like couple of years. And it's like, like Dota 2 has always been like number one, but then PUBG came out and it just like immediately trounced Dota 2. And it like that, and I don't remember what else, but it's like a couple of titles have consistently vied for the top three spots, but almost the entire time Civ 5 was on there. That's and then it cool. changed to Civ 6 when Civ 6 came out. Oh shit. Yeah. So it's like that it... It has a very dedicated core fan base, and it's I really like it. It's a great community. They're very helpful if you want to try and get into the game. If you go to the subreddit and you ask for help, there's lots of guides out there. Like I don't know why some communities are so much more helpful than others, but probably because multiplayer is not that great in Civilization. You're not competing against anybody else. You just want more people to play it, so the studio will support it more. It's also, it might, it might have a, a high barrier to entry, it's a huge barrier to end. You have to learn so much. Um, like I, Lisa was afraid because it's it's a daunting amount of stuff to learn when you do it. But she picked it up really fast. Like she's already playing on King um, and doing well on King, which is impressive for somebody who never really played it before. And and she's she's figuring it out. She's she's had some good games so far. Uh, but yeah, it, there's just like trying to learn all of the mechanics to the game. It, and especially like after like all the expansions come out because they only add mechanics. <laughs> so it's when you pick up the base game, there's enough to learn as it is. Two expansions later, they add like 30 more mechanics that you have to try and figure out. And then if you really want to be good at it, you have to like learn how to main max them. It, it becomes a lot of information you have to learn. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't have much of an update other than that. I love the game. Um, uh, I guess that was a pretty solid amount of stuff, but yeah. All right, before we kick you to our next our next uh, break, you had something you wanted to say about Stellaris. Oh, yeah. Stellaris is a game that I think we see on Steam sale fairly often. We've talked about it a few times, and, and other you guys have expressed interest in, in it before, too. It's a... It's like Civ, but in space and also real time, but also not real time. Because what I've learned by watching some gameplay of it when deciding whether or not I want to buy it, I do now, by the way. So you like figure out what to do with your spacefaring empire, and then you let like you give orders to the different units that you have in your empire to execute on your, your master plan. And then you have to like you can pause the game. So you can let it play out and you can choose the speed at which everything is developing and then you can pause it when you need time to develop your next strategy. I think that's a really cool mechanic because it's it's simultaneously turn-based and real-time, which is something I've never really seen before. You know, either it, historically it's either been it's a real-time strategy game or it's not real-time strategy game. It's turn-based. And this is almost a combination of the two. So it's interesting. I'll give you guys some background so that you can make... Cause Chris, you mentioned it was on your wish list. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, I think you've expressed interest. I don't know if you put it on your wish list or not. I think I bought it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's that, good for you. Uh, so the way it starts out, and I'm not, I mean, there are no spoilers because it's not like there's a dedicated campaign, but you're going to love this, Bill. You're absolutely going to love what I'm about to mm -hmm. explain. So you can start... Uh, when you start, you pick an empire, right? And there's some pre-made ones... Or you could create your own or create a random one, right? And first of all, the amount of choices that you have for building your empire, creating your empire, are massive. You could be a bloodthirsty turtle, which is what Lisa wants to be. You could be some sort of cat person. You could be... Uh, uh, they have, like, all these different 
variants of like what a creature could be. So arthropoids, mammalians, reptiles, lizards. Uh, they have an avian section, so you could be some sort of bird-like creature. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and then they in some expansions they added uh, robots and all sorts of other ones. I mean, there's some really creepy looking ones. There's some really cool looking ones. Uh, there's people, of course, uh, humanoid characters. But you create this empire and you get to choose a little bit about it. Like, is it militaristic? Is it peaceful? Do they like aliens? Do they not like aliens? So you create all these different uh, uh, details of the civilization that will affect how they will interact with other players in the game. In, in this case, AI players, right? And how other AI players will react to you. But most importantly, as you create them. So let's say you decide to create a race, right? That goes into the stock list of AI playable races so that if you then start another game, that race that you just created could show up against you in some other game. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, right? I, yeah. I've never heard of that happening before, but that's awesome. Remember Spore? I do. And yes, I I remember uh, that being a feature of that. One of those games that was like, you know, not as good as the hype, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you created a species, yeah. um, it would it automatically just uploaded. Uh, not just it wasn't just in your game; it was everybody's game. Yeah, anyone could encounter your species. Yeah, in their game, and mm -hmm. it was kind of cool. Yeah, I I agree. It was it was a way to have community involvement really for the yeah. whole game and spore. Now this one is local, right? It's it's dedicated to you, but nonetheless, it is. I thought a really neat mechanic that you don't see very often. Something else that I, I thought was, was pretty interesting, Bill, I, and I figure you, you appreciate stuff like this. So when you toggle the different settings of the game, a couple of the settings are like, you could start, you get to choose how many, how big the galaxy you're in is, right? So based on the number of stars, right? So you can go like 200, 400, 600, 800, or 1,000 stars in your galaxy, and then you're going to explore this galaxy. So most of the stars, if not all of them, I, I don't think quite all of them, but most of them will have planets that you can explore. So you can imagine if there's a thousand stars, most of them will have planets and some of those planets will be gas giants that have several moons. Like we're talking about thousands of potentially explorable planets, right? Not all of them are going to be habitable, but some of them will be. Uh, and not all of them that are habitable will be, will be compatible with your species. But again, not necessarily relevant. Uh, fact is that the game can be huge and you can even... So they there's... Two interesting things that can happen. You can start against civiliz other, other AIs, like other civilizations that are ahead of you in technology. Because the idea is that the civilization that you create pretty much just discovered faster than light travel. So, or at least like very quick space travel. So, you're new to the game. You're, you're the new guy on the block. And you can start against other civilizations that are more advanced than you also you can start or in your galaxy there can be like forgotten civilizations which are for whatever reason civilizations that used to be dominant in the galaxy but then kind of either reclused themselves or just you know withdrew to themselves uh and they can awaken whatever various events can happen where they can become awakened to who knows what happens. And you, at that point, you don't know what's going to happen. They could dominate the galaxy. They could try and uplift everybody else in the galaxy to get their level of technology because they're lonely and have no friends. Uh, who knows, right? Uh, and there's all sorts of like end game galactic emergencies that could happen, like aliens from another galaxy come in and try and take over, stuff like that. I, I actually didn't look too much into that because I want to buy the game and experience them for myself. But... Yeah, it's it's a real in-depth game. Uh, there's lots of different... Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can win, but the one thing that I've noticed... So I've, I've been watching a guy play who's, who's fairly, uh, fairly familiar with the game and, and has really played it a lot. And he said a lot of times, even for him, with all the experience that he has playing the game, meeting the victory conditions, quote-unquote, isn't necessarily even winning, just surviving. Is <laughs> like, if you if you start out, and you don't have to set this as a possible uh, condition for the game, but you can allow it to happen, which, again, won't guarantee since it's randomly generated, for a more advanced civilization to start directly next to you. So if that civilization happens to hate other aliens and be super militaristic... 
they might meet you, immediately decide we're going to fuck your shit up and also be super advanced compared to you. Oh, no. So it's pretty much game over at that point. Yeah. I didn't. I thought this was like a, an MMO. No. Yeah. This is... I, I think you might be able... I actually didn't look into that at all. Does it say multiplayer? It does not. That's why... Yeah. No. I, I wasn't sure if you could play with other... It wouldn't make sense to be able to play with other people because the games take so long. I am really interested in, in getting on this now. It's totally not... I guess I mixed this up with like a Star Citizen or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I haven't looked into what you get out of all of the expansion. I think the one that I saw, like the version I saw being played was slightly outdated compared to what they have. I think they're on like version 2 something and the one that I saw was like 1.7. And it was before some of the current DLCs that are out, but I've read that the that all of the DLCs, and there are many... As you can, as you saw here in, in Steam, there's, they're all individually worth the money. Together, they are incredible when you add them all up. And there's some smaller ones in there of like extra stuff. So like basically, the game itself I think is thirty or forty bucks. It, sometimes it drops down to twenty on Steam sale. I think that's when I got it was when it was twenty. Yeah, and and that's a great great deal and a awesome price to play for a game that you can get easily several hundred hours out of. But each of the expansions adds some enough value to each be worth $20. And then there's some cheaper ones on there, too, that don't give you nearly as much. But they're definitely worth it. They don't charge very much for them, either. So if you go, you could go and drop 120 bucks on it all at once, which I will. And <laughs> Bill just saw Railway Empire flop up on Steam. And mm -hmm. he is... He is livid. Fifteen dollars. I could have bought that shit show for ten dollars less than I. God damn it. <laughs> anyway, uh, that sounds sweet. We're yeah. gonna have to get. We're gonna have to play. One hundred and twenty bucks for all of it is probably what I'm gonna do, just so that I can give the users or our listeners, uh, Bill's dad. I hope yeah. you will enjoy the review I eventually give of it. Uh, a good idea as to what e all of the stuff that is out there for the game. But I honestly think the best value is just buying the base and then one of the expansions that you're interested Watch in. Watch the community play Railway Empire? No! <laughs> no! <laughs> We're going to break. Catch you on the flip side. More trains! Bill's Hill. Oh, no, that's not the song we're doing. Steam sale. Steam, Steam sale. Steam sale. Steam sale. Steam sale on Steam. All right, here we go. Now, oh, we got, <laughs> yeah. some, we got some good stuff here. We Co have a Koi Tecmo developer sale. Yeah, I don't know what the hell that is. Developer. Uh, it's, it's apropos because I have been playing, as you guys know, a whole bunch of this game. Neo Complete Edition. And Dead or Alive Rage. 6. Mm -hmm. But not like Neo Is that a volleyball one. game or a fighting game? Underneath Dead it? Or alive? Above it. Yeah. Uh, Dead or Alive. <laughs> it's a fighting game. Isn't there like a sexy volleyball game yeah. that's called Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball? Or oh my God. Shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. Okay. All right. 10% mm -hmm. off for Dead or Alive 6. Not sexy volleyball. Sexy fighting game for $54. I will take a glance at it because how sexy it's, it's, it's talking. not a great deal, but it's a brand new game that came out March first. Uh, mixed reviews, one thousand of them. Because there's not, I don't know, sexy volleyball. I think. Oh no, they're definitely sexy. Sexy fighting. Yep. Um, well, Chris, you've been playing Mortal Kombat X. Maybe you should pick this up. Oh, <laughs> that's hot. So, M Mortal <laughs> Kombat Ten though is is like it's like a work. Yeah. Work um, but uh, yeah, and, and not that interesting. It arrives X, but but seriously, Neo half off at twenty five dollars. Mm. Um, if if you liked the Souls games, or if you started to like them but got too depressed, 
uh, or if it was people. too slow. Um, Neo is a, uh, I can't recommend Wait it. Wait a minute. Enough. They released Warriors Orochi 4, Orochi 3, what? Af after Neo? And I didn't hear about it? I wonder if it was not good. I don't even know what this is. What I guess if you like Neo, the the developer has a uh, another entry out. Oh, this looks like a... Uh, Dynasty Warriors, you're a super samurai or something, and yeah. you chop up peasants. Neo is not this. Not um, that. But Pick up Neo for $25 if you have any interest in that. Let's see if there's anything else interesting here. Dynasty Warriors. Uh, oh, my God. Hell guys. yeah. Dynasty Warriors 9, The Revenge of Lou, Boo, and you. What That's is, not what it's what called, is Berserk? <gasps> Band of the Hawk. That is a classic uh, uh, IP. A guy carries around a huge blade, and uh, I think he's your like edge lord, grumpy guy. This has a lot of fans. Hmm. Um, Berserk and the Band of the Hawk. Like looks like an anime. Yeah. Uh, looks good though. What Twenty-five bucks or thirty 30. bucks. Yeah. I guess if you haven't really gotten into this developer and fallen in love with it, I would I would just go with the Neo for twenty-five bucks. And then go from there. A lot of the stuff isn't exactly a, a steal. I mean, Dynasty Warriors 9 at $31. Attack on Titan for $30. Um, i have heard of good things what? about that game. Dynasty Warriors as a franchise does have a pretty loyal base. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's something that just appeals to a certain type of person, but yeah. How much is it again? $30 for 9 14 mm -hmm. for 8 yeah, I might try. If 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 you were interested, if you were thinking about it, I would probably say start with one of the earlier ones. Yeah. For a lower price. Yeah. And if you like that one, you'll also like nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you like any From of what the I've old. seen, uh, there, uh, most of it carries over. Like, yeah. All right. Familiar games. Um, uh, but yeah, Neo is... is Conan Exiles. 20 bucks. You're either a beefcake dude or a beefcake lady. An online multiplayer survival game set in the lands of Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> if Arnie if Arnie isn't involved in this, destroy the game. Yes. Yeah. Survive in the vast open world, sandbox, build a home and a kingdom, dominate your enemies in a single multiplayer. Good gravy. There's a lot of open world survival games out there now. How do you even pick? Billy, you'll appreciate this. There's a beefcake woman at the gym this morning. Yeah. And she could out bench me, so I just walked right by the bench and I went over to like the hammer strength machines to because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. You mentioned like Conan no. Exiles, fifty percent off for twenty bucks. I guess if you're looking for a new entry into like well, a new game to try in the open world survival, that would be cool, especially if you like the Conan series, but I don't think I'm gonna give it a shot for that price. This war of mine, seventy five percent off for five dollars. One hundred percent worth it. Get it. If you haven't gotten it yet, get it. You will get your five dollars worth. It her is war I tried to believe. Yes. Yeah, her war <laughs> I tried to believe. Um there's DLC out there. The DLC is supposed to be super good. So I'm just waiting till that goes on sale. Um a buddy at work was like, Oh, the DLC's dope. And let's I didn't buy if, it. Uh, I love the base game. Let's see, if, let's see what's going on here. Um Complete Edition. Or fifteen or fourteen forty three. What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, the base game itself wor is worth that amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, if you're getting all the DLC, uh, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But you can you could buy the the base game for seventy five percent off, enjoy yourself, and wait till the DLC goes on the same sort of price reduction. Mm -hmm. Not a bad idea. Uh, Pillars of Eternity. What is this? This reminds me of the Halo ship, um, Pillars of the Pillar of Autumn. Can we just can we just appreciate that that series had the greatest ship names of all time? Yeah, they were awesome. They Truth were and reconciliation. Incredible ship names. Yeah. What else? What else were some of the other ones? You guys remember? Nope. Anyway, Pillar of Eternity, uh, Pillars of the Eternal Pillars of Erectile Dysfunction. Prepare to be <laughs> by a world where the choices you make and the paths you choose shape your destiny. Obsidian Entertainment, the developer of Fallout New Vegas and South Park: The Stick of Truth. Together with Paradox Interactive is proud to present Ooh. Pillars of Eternity. Parado so, some strong development talent. I like mm -hmm. the Paradox there. Some some strong development talent from the look of it. Obsidian. Uh, very good Paradox. reviews that they're flashing on the screen. Not nines out of tens left and right. Uh, okay, what is it? Looks like isometric. Um, uh, what do you what, 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 view? What's that fucking mm. game? Um, Diablo. Diablo. Uh, mm. Looks like a Diablo clone. Mm. Um, Eighteen dollars at forty percent off. It, this is really highly reviewed. I might, 
I might make this move if I did some more reading on it. If Frank were to tell me he likes this game, I'd get it. <laughs> Frank, what's 30 your thought? 30-second pause for awesome Halo ship names. Okay. Shadow of Intent, Farsight Lost, Long Night of Solace, Ascendant Justice. Oh, fuck. Harbinger of Piety. Jesus Those are all Christ. coveted ship names. There is a UNSC, Do You Feel Lucky? <laughs> okay. What else is on sale? Railway Empire, 70% Your favorite off. Game God damn it. <laughs> if you wanna if you wanna buy more train simulator, <laughs> go right ahead. Go right the fuck ahead. Which is just more train simulator. <sighs> Warhammer Vermintide also on sale for not at all the first time on the show. <laughs> uh, at eighteen dollars, you know, Warhammer, we said it we say it every time. It's a very popular series with a shitload of lore. It's probably probably pretty good. None of us are into it. Jackbox games, forty to sixty two percent off. These are fun. These are like your quiz games that if you're sitting around with your friends, you don't have you don't want to play a board game. These are good to do. You I've all... played some of these um, just with with a community on my drunken peasants as a patron over there. Like like he'll do like some kind of show for the patrons and like we'll get to play live and, yeah. and they're, they're, they're fun party games for sure. Um, you know they're 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 silly. Um, imagine you know in the spirit of things like Castle Track. Some of them are, are reminiscent of Castle Crashers in some respects. Some of them are reminiscent of, of um, uh, like uh, Cards Against Humanity, Apples to Apples, those sorts of things, trivia type things. It's tough to spend more than ten bucks on one of those, though. Yeah, yeah. it real unless you're unless you're routinely having people over or your family loves to play them together. Um, good application for that. Yeah. Um, but you know, or if you're a, a streamer with, with a with a community and you want to interact with them, you know, they really. Yeah, we um, don't want to interact with anyone. I have no <laughs> desire to pick any of these up, although they are fun to play. You need people. You need multiple people. You need friends. Uh, which you know none of us have. So, yeah. uh, lastly, here, Extreme Legends Dynasty Warriors Complete Edition. This, this guy's within eyebrows. the Dynasty Warriors uh, yeah. thing. We already kind of touched on it. Can you open that up and see if like the first one's there for thirty cents? Go back as far as you can and play the oldest ones. They are ridiculous, they and are if they're cheap, they're, like, like PS2 era. And get yourself if you're of legal drinking age. <laughs> get yourself all drunk up, but don't hurt yourself. Whatever. Don't follow my advice. Uh, but my humorous advice is to get all liquored up and play that game because it is a it's like playing through an action movie it's sweet see there are like like okay uh, there's we always go through the special offers tab but i feel like we've been neglecting other parts of steam during this segment of the show the let's take a minute okay Grand Theft Auto 5 for 15 bucks 50 percent off a 30 i still haven't played it if for some reason you have not played any grand theft auto game or at least this most recent one 15 bucks is a fucking steal yeah um absolutely it's a great game it's a great game um any platform 100%. Do, uh, do it. If you like that sort of thing, you know. Gritty, over-the-top crime drama, shooting, carjacking, offensive language and themes. And other um, fuckery. I very, we very much are into that. So. I think uh, if you hit browse all, we'll probably see some other good stuff. Uh, While that happens, 30-second timeout for more awesome That's Halo ship names. Okay. Halo ship names, go. All Under Heaven. Forward Unto Dawn. Oh, that is such a good one. Song of the East. Jesus. Point of No Return and Unto the Breach. I want it like I want one person to have been in charge of these names and like we just need more ship names and they're like here here's gold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Another Navy one. immediately you hires for him. 15, for, for 15 bucks. Uh, honestly, I think it's worth it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Ark Survival Evolved for 20 bucks. I've bought that. I believe, and I still haven't played it. There's a lot of games I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an LP of this, and then I never do. Fallout 4 Game of the Year Edition, thirty bucks. I think it's worth it. Train Simulator for fifteen dollars. I talked about. Well, I was bitching about Railway Empire on Black Wake, and people said Train Simulator was kind of fun, but then had severe drawbacks. So I ended up not getting it. So that's the advice of Black Wake. Interesting. I don't remember. Uh, there's. A lot of stuff here. I don't Car mechanic simulator. Hell yeah! Oh boy. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Let's take a look. That 17. feels like you would learn too much. Oh man, this. Build and expand your repair yeah, service it, like, empire. Mm. Could you use this as a tutorial for so your we project car? Garages. We got tools. We got snappable parts. You know, I might buy this game. I've been watching a lot of how-to videos on fixing cars and. Uh, this might make me feel like a smart looks, guy. You should buy Kerbal car, Space. What's that? You should buy Kerbal Space, Kerbal Space program. program. I have it. Oh, well then you should play it. And then build a spaceship. Just don't yeah. play it because I'm not smart. Like I'm not. 
I think go to the moon, I Bill. I, too. I, I need to buy a goddamn truck truck simulator. Mm. That's it. Uh, Anybody uh, play the Tropico series? No. Yeah, Tropico Six is ten percent off. I tried playing some of the older ones, and it was one of those where the um, mechanics was were too hard for me to quite get. But Frank, I think you should pick up Tropico Six, learn how to get good at it, and then tell me about it because <laughs> you're like a dictator on a little island and. You force people to do it, do stuff, and you make money and build an army, and you're basically, you know, El Presidente. Uh, yeah, I'd be good at that. Do you go, like, meet other countries or other islands or anything like that? Or I think you manipulate the Soviet up. Union and the U.S. to bribe you to do different stuff. Yeah. That's exactly what I would do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're basically a cuber. Like, you cuber. Like the plot to some of all fears. Did you see Cuba uh, voted to, uh, I think their Congress voted to a bunch of constitutional amendments? No. Yeah. yeah. There's a big changes down there. Read about it if you are a smart person. Word. Uh, I think that's a gunsmith. Okay. <gasps> Can I make my full nuclear assault calculator? <laughs> uh, build up your own arms in a manufacturing company, find your factory, uh, buy your resources, produce a wide range of military equipment, sell the highest bidder, good or bad, it's up to you. Okay, so seems like in the same vein of a uh, car repairman boy simulator. There's a lot boy. of these management simu- quote unquote simulator games that are super popular now. Um, I don't know. You might end up being in a menu simulator. I think if you're a th- if you're a 12 year old edge lord though, I think this is something that might appeal to you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's make the call. Yeah. Let's call it right now. Do it, uh, 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 Frank. Um, I would, I think I'll honestly go with Dynasty Warriors because I enjoyed the series. I don't think I've played it since six, uh, but I always enjoyed it. I thought they were fun games and they're cheap. All right. I'm going to say get Railway Empire if you are in the pit of depression and all your friends need to, need to see you make a cry for help (laughs) because that that qualifies as self-harm. Um, yeah, I gotta say I, I would probably go with, uh. The old Grand Theft Auto, because I haven't played it. Mm. Who's next? Uh, I'll go with this war of mine for five bucks. This sore of yours? The, this yeah. sore this of this mine. Swore. Swore. Visit the doctor. Get some cream. This swore. <laughs> Pay your health care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sore simulator. It's just about <laughs> anal sores. Oh, God. Chris! <laughs> oh, sorry. We were Bill's towing down. the line. <laughs> You just uh, stomped over it. I'd probably go with this war of mine, too. Hmm. There's a sequel? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that's, that's where my brain was. <laughs> Frank? I already went. You already went? Dynasty Warriors. Frank, go again. <laughs> Frank again? Frank, what'd you pick? Stellaris. <laughs> Frank, what else would you pick? <laughs> um, Euro Truck Simulator 2! There you go. All right, good. great, great pick, Frank. Euro Truck Simulator. Jack off in the box games. Right? I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad, Frank, that your only pick at all this whole episode was Euro Truck Simulator. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna go this War of Mine, five bucks. This but there were many strong contenders. Oh, what's that? Go back one. That was we didn't I'm we didn't see that before. Let it shine. Little Nightmares for six doll hairs, 70% off. This is, a, this is a Genevieve game. This is a Genevieve I'm game. I think you're like a little shine. tiny person going through. But guys, or, we made the call. The episode's wait, over. What do we do? Oh, no, no, oh, what do we do? No, no, oh, oh, you're a little, I have that jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Immerse yourself in I little. I thought you have a yellow jacket like that. You're in a spooky, you're like in a spooky giant mansion house as a little teeny girl me. trying to escape. It's, a, it's another... Neatly stylized platformer, and I think you can still die heinously. Uh, That's me! It's 100%. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think I might go for this for six bucks. This looks like a lot of fun, and the ratings oh are very God, low. Oh, there's big Ginormous. bad foes just like me! <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, this what... is just a Genevieve simulator. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, I think we can call it. Thank you for joining us. Wait, for... wait, wait, wait. For... Frank didn't pick yet. <laughs> <laughs> This little war of mine, (laughs) I'm going to let it shine. All right. Once again, don't forget (laughs) to not always but never make twist triple do. Oh, join us on Tuesdays at 730 or 8 o'clock whenever we get our sound work. And we are live streaming on the YouTubes, (gasps) typically under Dr. Wet Farts uh, channel, but sometimes on the TGNA one. I'm sure you can. Yeah, it really depends on which one of us is actually playing the game. I'm going to spell out Dr. Wet Farts for you. D R W H. E T F A A R T Z. 
That What's was eight. eight. Spelling? There's an 88 at uh, the end. Well, they the are. Um, I, I do have your channel there, Chris, featured yes. on the TGNA channel on YouTube. So if you just go to TGNA and look on the right hand column of the homepage, you will see them there. Chat with us uh, in the live stream chat. We will chat back. Hell, if you want to play a game with us, if you want to get depth and jump in, we will fucking do it. Yeah, man. She, yeah. B- buy in when it's low. <laughs> Still. <laughs> all right. We love you all, all of our listeners. God bless every one of you. And Jake especially says mm. that he's super about yeah. it. Me too. Nice. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Sorry, cock him, lock him, and rock him, baby. See you later. <laughs>